a felony record or have had their prospects. Well, we could also talk about, let's see, Bill Clinton. I don't know if George W. Bush officially admitted to smoking marijuana. I think he did admit to being drunk at some time in his life. And also, I think it's relatively well established a user of cocaine at some point in his life managed to get along just fine with that. Barack Obama as well. People will misuse this, sure. There will be sad cases, just like there's the sad case of the 10-year-old kid who got run over this morning because we let those damn SUVs drive around, guzzling gas and polluting our environment. But unless and until we're prepared to continue with the fallacy that drugs are different in kind, and particularly that marijuana and then we can get to heroin and LSD, and I want to get there, because I think that's why I want to experiment first with marijuana. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe it will be a disaster. What I do know is, as we're assessing whether it's been a success or a disaster in Colorado, we ought not only focus on that one doctor's number, we also want to look at the fact that the governor of Colorado has recently indicated that the $60 million the state has taken in in medical marijuana fees is allowing them not to cut police, not to cut fire departments, not to cut school teachers, not to cut public education. And at the end of the day, for all those poor stoner kids who, candidly, I don't think are going to be that productive members of society, even if we do let them have a little bit easier access to pot, I think that $60 million is going to do a heck of a lot more harm, or good, than whatever harm those occasional troublemaking kids who will find trouble in other ways. And the simple story is, yes, we do have some people who with any dangerous substance, whatever it is, will misuse it and cause harm. We also have an awful lot of responsible people. And unless and until Bill is prepared to say that I trust big government to make those choices and to tramp on individual liberty in the name of keeping us safe for, from ourselves, I think the theoretical argument is profound. I think the practical argument is challenging, and that's why I hope California begins the next stage of experimentation. And I hope that there won't be as many forces as we've already seen eager to run in, not over the test tubes, and say, see, the experiment failed.
whether we're going to have experiments. Now, the kind of experiment that Doug is talking about is kind of jurisdiction by jurisdiction experiment. Um, but that's not the only kind of experiment. There are actual scientific experiments um, that one can have about um, marijuana. One of, the, one of the charges you frequently hear uh, is that, well, you know, the, the DEA just won't let this happen. It's sitting on the science of the campaign progress. I just want to tell you it's not so. There are, uh, at least as of May of this year, there were 119 DEA authorized uh, experimental projects going on on the value of mar potential value of marijuana as a medicine. Uh, and then either 18 or 19 of those did involve either smoked marijuana or marijuana patches. It's not that the DEA, you know, people in DEA are human beings like everybody else. Um, they can be in pain, they have serious operations, they have parents and family members uh, who have serious operations who can use painkillers. We're against painkillers, guys. We all want better painkillers. The question is, the real question is, whether by legalizing marijuana, much less any of the rest of these things, are you going to get what any sensible person would recognize to be a responsible and safe painkiller when there is no check, when there is no check for adulteration, uh, for, for dosage, when you're not going to a doctor, when, as in, as in the Proposition 19, will authorize people to grow this stuff in their backyard. Tell me one doctor anywhere, one responsible doctor anywhere, who tells his patients, why don't you scroll in your backyard, don't take it when you want to, and, and that'll be okay. And it's not medicine, it's voodoo. It would cost him money, so I can understand why a responsible yeah. doctor wouldn't want to recommend that. Yeah, well, that's not, that's not the point that, that you made that I was, you know, that, that as part of, you know, the, the, the giant federal vortex, I was making a fortune. Um, I'm going you know, to write the Department of Justice and tell them to send me the rest of the fortune because it didn't show up my paycheck when I was working there. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, there's some people who thought, indeed, I was offered three or four times um, I didn't, to go into private practice what I was making. Uh, as a Department of Justice lawyer, maybe I should wrote to, write those people too and tell them to send the money retroactively, but I sure didn't make it while I was working for the government. Um, uh, another point that Doug brought up is, well, look, the, the system that we've got now, if it actually works, who is taking the hindmost from, from our drug laws? Well, it's minorities. Minority and black, and that's true. Blacks are disproportionately jailed, and not just for crack cocaine. They're disproportionately jailed for drugs in general. Of course, they're also uh, disproportionately represented in the criminal justice system, not just in drugs, but they're disproportionately represented in everything. Except the very, very few. You, know, you, you don't get white collar, you don't get environmental offenses, you don't get these kind of you know, complicated business offenses, um, you don't get uh, on a services statute uh, offenses, that kind of thing. But generally, what else? What people normally view as crime as blacks are overrepresented. And that brings me to another war story I want to tell you about. When I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, I did the case by the name of the United States versus Olbis. I wish I remembered the citation. I don't. But the name is O-L-B-I-S. What happened in that case, it was a crack cocaine case. It was a big crack conspiracy going on in, uh, in Fredericksburg, Virginia, which none of you has probably uh, heard of. But it's kind of in a town of some size. Um, originally, we had left that to the state. We didn't feel like uh, it goes to the federal level. But the town leaders demanded a uh, meeting with the U.S. Attorney's Office. And I was high up enough in the office to be in on this meeting. And they uh, came to us and said, look, these crack dealers are turning our town into a free fire zone. I mean, people can't sit out on their stoop, which is something people in Virginia and Southern do. They sit out on their stoop, uh, or, or, or kind of at the end of the day. Um, well, I couldn't do that anymore because it was dangerous. I mean, there were bullets whizzing through the neighborhood. Every one of the community leaders who came to our house condemning us for not doing anything, for not doing anything, was black. Because the communities that were affected by these bullies 
where the crack here where it's more black. And I remember in particular one comment was when I explained, well, you know, we have limited resources that we have the responsible for the Eastern District of Virginia, which includes uh, some, some densely populated Washington suburbs, Richmond, uh, and also densely populated uh, southeastern Virginia and Norfolk, Suffolk, the naval, naval bases and military facilities there. They just stopped me and said, look, look, I know I hear what you're telling me. The truth of the matter is people like you don't care about people like us. In other words, you white guys in Brooks Brothers suits, just like, you know, working class black people be at the mercy of these drug dealers. And I know what you're up to. That's how it really works on the ground. Minorities more than other people, more than other people, depend on law enforcement to protect them against the things against which they cannot protect themselves. And that was true also of the lady I talked about. It's true. Parents should be responsible for their own children. There's absolutely no question about that. But parents can get in over their head. That's not. They're human beings. Meth I don't know what I would do if I had a uh, son or daughter addicted to meth. Because um, that's something the parent you know, it is kind of a really hard time handling. And she had tried to handle it. And, and she, she wasn't stupid about it. She wasn't careless about it. She needed force. She did need jail. That is what that girl needed. She needed to be in jail. It's true, as Doug says, you get a lot of bad stuff in jail, uh, but you can't get meth. You know, I mean, there may be some deals where you can, but in the federal system, you're not, you will not get meth, uh, not in any federal prison. And if she had been cut off on that, if we had used what was needed in that case, was not understanding, it wasn't a psychiatrist count, it wasn't a loop therapy, it wasn't an intervention, she needed to be where she couldn't get. It. She needed jail, she needed the power and force of the federal government, and we did not give it to Let me make one more point. Make one more point. Um, there is the question as to whether what we're doing now uh, is, is making any headway. And then much of the criticism uh, of federal criminal law with the box is that we're paying all the time, <coughs> as Doug says, you know, we're putting people in jail. Um, some of them are considerable. So what are we getting for? You know, we want the drug war? No, we haven't drug No. And the answer is no, we haven't won the drug war. We also haven't won the war against crime in general. We haven't won the war against poverty because some things are hard and are, and are also intractable. And the answer is not to surrender. The answer is to fight harder. It's like the war against terrorism. It would all be nice to say, well, we're going to withdraw from Afghanistan because we've been there a long time. Only the other side has a say, and the other side in the drug war has a say uh, as well. In fact, um, there's something called the Monitoring the Future Study. It's not run by the DEA or uh, you know, the drugs are out of the White House. It's run by the University of Michigan, not exactly the right wing center. What it does is it is tracks the drug use in middle and high school kids, may improve. And the results are not what you expect if you, if you just read the paper. Actually, there has been a 23, according to, uh, to the Monitoring the Future survey, uh, there's been a 23% decrease in the amount of illegal drugs uh, used by uh, middle and high school kids over the last five years. You might remember you know, people from my day, which admittedly is it was way back. Uh, but you might have heard about him, a guy by the name of Timothy Leary, who's a professor of Harvard. He's, he's, you know, even Doug is too young to remember that. He probably read about it, you know. Um, and Leary started as kind of the LSD man. LSD is extreme, I mean, it, it is so mind altering. People have been able to walk off the top of buildings and walk into traffic, you know, in the freeway. I mean, it's just a 
completely to my knowledge. Right. 